good to be here, thank you. I'd like to start here with a story, and it's a story that is probably familiar to many people in this room. It takes place around Thanksgiving time, and it involves a young man named John. John was born and raised Catholic, like many kids. His parents took him to Mass every Sunday. They brought him through Catholic school, and then they sent him off to college. But around Thanksgiving time of his first semester at school, John came home, and he was sitting around the dinner table with his parents, telling them about his first semester at school. They asked him all the normal questions, you know, tell us about your classes, tell us about the people you're meeting. And John went on and on with great excitement. He said, you know, I met so many new people, I'm involved with this intramural sport, I'm thinking about joining this fraternity, there's all these student groups going on. But then at one point, John's mother asked him, yeah, and what about church? Which church are you going to? There was somewhat of an awkward silence at that question. And John said, well, you know, I haven't gone to Mass yet since I've been in college. I just haven't, you know, had the time. It's really busy. There's, there's just so much going on. I, I just haven't found time to get to Mass yet. His mother was a little taken aback. She didn't quite know what to say. She looked to his father, but his father didn't know what to say. And so his mom responded, John, we raised you Catholic. Going to Mass is really important. It's something you have to do. You need to find some way to go to church. But John said, Mom, you know, it's okay. I I've met so many new people here, and almost none of them go to church. But they're good people. They're open-minded. They're tolerant. They're kind. Uh, you know, I just don't see the need to go to Mass anymore. Now, chances are either you or someone you know has had an experience just like this one. This isn't an isolated story, it's one that's playing out in dining rooms and living rooms all over our country. If there's one thing that most of the recent studies on religion have showed, it's that we're losing young people at extraordinary rates from our church. In fact, the latest survey shows that 50% of young people, so 50% of millennials between 20 and 30 who were baptized Catholic are no longer Catholic today. So think about what that means. Over the last 20 or 30 years, half of the children you've seen baptized, half of the children you've seen confirmed, half of the young couples you've seen married probably no longer call themselves Catholic. The latest Pew Research study also found that of the people who leave the church, 79% leave before age 23. So these people who are leaving the Catholic Church are leaving as teenagers, college students, and young adults. These, for the most part, are not middle-aged or senior-aged people who are fed up with the changes of Vatican II and are leaving the church. These are mostly young people. We're, we're hemorrhaging our young, our young kids. Finally, perhaps the most discouraging statistic at all, of all comes from the most recent Pew Religious Forum landscape study. What they do is they interview 30,000 American adults and they ask them all sorts of religious questions. Their goal is to get a good sense of the religious pulse of our country. They do this survey every seven years and the most recent one just came out in 2015, so it's fairly, re it's fairly new. And in this survey, they have what they call the loss-gain ratio. The loss-gain ratio. It's an important factor for the study. Let me tell you what it is. To calculate the loss-gain ratio, you take the number of people who have left your religious tradition, and you divide it by the number of people you've gained, not uh, including births or deaths. So, so think about that. Ideally, you want this number, this loss-gain ratio, to be less than one. You want to be losing fewer people than you're gaining. No Christian group had a loss-gain ratio less than one. Evangelical Protestants hovered at around 1.07, so they're kind of treading water. They're losing as many people as they're gaining. Every other group was higher than one. But you know what group in their survey had the worst loss-gain ratio of any religious or non-religious group? Us, Catholics. Our loss-gain ratio was 6.45.
6.45. That means for every one person who's coming in the front doors of our church, six and a half people are leaving out the back door. For every one person who converted to the church at Easter, six and a half have drifted away, most of them quietly over time. Now, think about these numbers. 50% of young people have left. Almost 80% leave before age 23 of those who left. And 6.45 leave for every one person that comes in. If you were, say, a business, imagine you're a CEO, and your director of marketing comes in and says, hey, boss, just a minor problem, wanted to let you know, we've lost 50% of our customers. What do you think the boss would do? He would be in absolute red alarm mode. He would say, this is problem number one for our organization. If we don't solve this, we are gonna be decimated in the upcoming years, if not months. This, these trends can't continue. Now we all know this, we all feel this. We don't need numbers to tell us that young people are leaving the church in droves. We all know this personally. I'd like you to raise your hand if either you yourself have a son or a daughter who's drifted away from the church, or if you have a close friend who has a son or daughter who's drifted away from the church. Look around, take a second, look around. I mean, this is 80, 90% of the hands in this room. This is a real and personal issue for most of us here. Now, whenever I travel the country giving talks, I usually speak on all sorts of subjects, from evangelization to Catholic social teaching to family life, but no matter what topic I'm speaking on, whenever there's a Q&A period at the end, this is the number one thing that I get asked about. And when I'm talking with priests, they tell me this is the number one thing that people in our parish are worried about. How do we get our young people back to the church? My son, my daughter has left. I'm devastated. I don't know what to do. How can I help? When I answer this question, I spent two years researching this problem. I poured over all the different surveys and studies of people who have left and some studies of people who have come back. I interviewed several dozen people who left the church and stayed away, several dozen more who left and ended up coming back. My goal was to figure out what works, what is actually drawing young people back to the church. The result of all this was a book that I wrote uh, about a year ago called Return, How to Draw Your Child Back to the Church. And the book includes a summary of everything I learned during this entire process. However, for the sake of this talk, what I'm gonna do spending over the next 20, 25 minutes is to condense some of the main tips and strategies from this return book to help you get some good ideas about how to draw young people back. Before we get into the strategies, though, of what to do, I'd first like to start off with three things that won't draw them back. Three things that you should not do if your goal is to help a young person return to the church. The bad strategy number one is to play the passive wait and see game. Now, for years, uh, if you approached your local priest or pastor and you said, you know, my son, my daughter was, was raised in the church, you know them, you, you baptized them, you saw them grow up, but now they no longer believe in God, what do I do? The priest or the pastor would often say something like, well, you know, for many young people, it's kind of a phase they go through, they go off to college, they kind of explore life on their own, but, you know, give them space, give them time, and eventually they'll come back. More specifically, a lot of priests and pastors would advise that when they get married or when they have children, then they'll come back to the church. But here's the thing, uh, if that was ever a good strategy, and there's a lot of statistical reasons to doubt that it was actually a good strategy at any point, it's certainly not a good one today. Why? A few reasons. First, people are waiting longer and longer than ever before in our country's history to get married. Did you know that in the 1960s, the average age for a man and woman to get married for the first time was 23 for a man, and 20 for a woman, all right? Average age to get married, 23 for a man, 20 for a woman. Today, the average age is 29 for a man and 26 for a woman. So think about what that means. If we're waiting for young people to get married before they return to the church, that's an extra six years that they are away from the church, making it more unlikely that they'll find their way back on their own. Even more, when they do get married, they're less and less getting married in a Catholic church. 
And so there is no magnet or lure to draw back an engaged couple to the church. Second reason why this is a bad strategy is many people think that if we just wait till young people have children, they'll return. But did you know that today we have the lowest birth rate in recorded American history? The average woman is having fewer children than at any other point in the history of America. So if they have children, which isn't a given, they again are unlikely to bring them to be baptized in the church. So for those reasons and several more, it's not a good idea just to passively wait and hope that a young person will come back to the church of their own volition. Instead, we need active strategies. We need to draw them back through engaging tips and tactics, and that's what we're going to learn here in a moment. But that's the first bad strategy. Don't play the passive wait-and-see game. Don't just sit on the sidelines and hope that they'll come back on their own. All right, the second bad strategy is nagging. Nagging. Now, here's some snickers, so I'm guessing we've all experienced that a little bit, nagging. You know, whenever I interviewed a lot of young people who have left the church, this came up in almost every case when I asked, why won't you come back? They say, oh, you know, anytime I go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas, my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, it's just nag, 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 nag. Go to Mass. Why aren't you going to Mass? Why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? The problem with nagging is that it broods resentment. And nobody comes back to the church because they resent the church. It doesn't follow. Nagging is not a good approach. Instead, we need to follow the model of John Paul II, who said, the church never imposes. She only proposes. You got that? The church doesn't nag somebody to fall in love with her. The church just proposes her divine mercy and welcomes people to experience. So that's the second thing not to do is don't nag. Don't nag. It doesn't work, and it often makes things worse. A third bad strategy is to dismiss their issues. I talk to a lot of young people all the time who uh, were raised Catholic but no longer identify as Catholic today, and many of them have pretty serious-minded, thoughtful reasons as to why they no longer go to church. Some of them, for example, say that they no longer believe in God, and they've never been presented any good reasons to think that God exists. Others say that they had a bad experience with a particular priest or a parish or a Catholic friend or family member, and they just don't want to be associated with the church anymore. Still more disagree with the church's teachings, whether they be the sexual teachings or teachings on the Bible or Mary or the Pope. The problem, though, is that for a lot of these young people, whenever the topic of religion comes up with their parents or grandparents, they're mostly treated with derision and dismissal. Their mom might say, oh, come on, why can't you just go to Mass? And instead of asking them why they don't want to go to Mass, they're just met with condescension and sometimes even mockery. If you want to draw a young person back to the church, you need to take their objections seriously. And in a moment, I'm going to show you some good ways to do that. So those are three things not to do if you want to draw someone back to the church. Don't play the passive wait and see game. Don't nag them and don't dismiss their issues. But if that's true, what should we do? Well, that's what we're going to finish the presentation with here. And in this part, I'd like to share with you seven steps that will draw any young person back to the church. Now, let me add a preface to these seven steps before we get into them. First of all is a caveat. First, these are steps, not a formula. We all know that there's no formulaic approach to, say, evangelization, that if you just take a person and you plug them into these steps, then voila, they'll emerge evangelized at the end. I wish it was as simple as that, but God gave us all this pesky gift known as free will. Each of us has free will, including the young people that we're trying to attract back to the church. And so these steps won't guarantee that a young person will find their way back, but they will increase the odds dramatically. They will make it far more likely that a young person who has left the church will start moving and finding his way back. A second caveat is that I'm going to cover these steps here in the next 15 minutes, but they usually take a long time to traverse. Often somebody drifts away from the church over a period of months or years, and it can sometimes take just as long to draw them back. 
So don't think that you can jot these steps right, uh, down right now, go home, call your son or daughter, follow these steps, and then tomorrow they'll be asking to go to the confessional. Uh, it doesn't usually work that way. I, God willing, maybe it, it might in some cases, but not usually. So with these steps, you need patience. You need to understand that this is a fairly long process and you need to commit to it for the long haul. Finally, these steps you might consider more as thresholds. I've talked to lots and lots of parents who have successfully drawn their children back to the church. Lots and lots of mentors and campus ministers who have helped usher young people back to Christ through his church. And so what these seven steps do is sort of summarize the different thresholds along the way. So with all those caveats in mind, let's dive in here. Step number one is to pray and fast. Pray and fast. Now, I don't mean this trite, uh, tritely as if this was a Catholic conference and so we got to start with the first step of prayer. I'm serious. If you're not praying for a young person to come back to the church, everything else you're doing is spinning your wheels. If you're not praying for a young person to come back to the church, you're wasting your time. Pray, pray, pray. Right now, we're at the Eucharistic Congress. There's an adoration chapel 100 feet away. Before you leave, take 10 minutes and go in there and pray for a young person in your life to come back to the church. Prayer is the greatest force we have in this endeavor. Perhaps our model here is a saint from the fourth century, Saint Monica. Most of you know her story. Saint Monica had a young son who might be familiar to most of us. Listen to this. Her young son was uh, somewhat boisterous. He hung out with a rowdy crowd. He was smart, he was witty, but he didn't want to have anything to do with religion. He liked to spend most of his time carousing with his friends, playing practical jokes, womanizing. He even uh, took a mistress and moved in with her without them being married and had a child with her at a wedlock. This sounds pretty familiar to many of us here. In fact, one mother told me, that's the 21st story of any young man in our culture, and it is. But Monica, this young man's mother, was distraught over all of his decisions, and she didn't know what to do. She tried to reason with him. She tried to convince him to believe in God and to follow the Christian way, but he didn't want to have anything to do with it. In fact, in the young man's memoirs, he records that he openly mocked his mother's faith. He thought it was silly and childish. However, Monica kept praying. She prayed, she prayed, she fasted for her son. As her son traveled around the world, she followed him. Eventually, he made his way to Milan, where she followed him there, and for the first time, she reached rock bottom. She thought, I've tried everything. I've prayed relentlessly, and I see no progress. So she went and met with a local bishop of Milan, Bishop Ambrose, who we now remember as St. Ambrose, and she complained to him about her son. She said, I talked to him, I talked to him, and nothing seems to work. And Ambrose gave her this advice. He said, Monica, speak less to Augustine about God and more to God about Augustine. Good advice for all of us. So she doubled down on her prayers. She prayed that if Augustine wouldn't hear truth from her lips, then maybe he would hear it somewhere else. And it turned out that Ambrose was that very person. Augustine encountered Ambrose and was impressed. He was the first serious-minded intellectual Christian that Augustine had come across. And as Augustine listened to his sermons, he became enchanted by this Christian way. He eventually asked Ambrose to be baptized, and now he's remembered as Saint Augustine, one of the greatest saints in the history of our church and one of the building blocks of Western civilization. Now, all that came because of Monica's prayer. Because even though what she was saying wasn't working, it wasn't getting through, she prayed for him to come to faith. And her prayers were answered in the figure of another person, Ambrose, who came into Augustine's life. So pray, pray, pray for a young person who's left the church and make your prayer the same as Monica's. Pray, maybe, for an Ambrose to come into their life, to speak truth to them if they won't hear it from you. So that's step number one, pray and fast. Step number two is to prepare yourself, prepare yourself. A lot of times, if you're trying to win a young person back to the church, they're going to have questions that you're going to need to be ready to answer. So you're going to want to prepare yourself. Now, there are lots of questions that might pop up your way, but there's really one question you need to answer above all, and it's this one. 
you need to be able to answer the question, why are you Catholic? Why are you Catholic? If someone stopped you on the street when we leave this great Congress, and they say, hey, where were you? You say, oh, I was at this Catholic conference. They say, oh, yeah, why are you Catholic? What would you say? What would you say? Some of us might say, well, that's the way I was raised. My parents were Catholic. My grandparents were Catholic. It's, that's just the way our family is. True, true, but not a good answer to that question. Some of us might say, well, it makes me feel good. It makes me happy. True, true, not a good answer. Why? Because these are subjective answers. They're personal to you, but they're not going to convince anybody else that they should take the Catholic Church seriously. What you need are good, objective reasons to explain why you're Catholic. Now, why is it important to be able to answer this question? Because young people have magnificent hypocrite radars. And if they determine that you have no good reason to be Catholic, if they can detect that you don't seem to have a good reason to go to Mass, then why would they? Why would they? Their thought process is, if, they just go, if they're just going through the motions, I don't want to have anything to do with that. So you need a good reason to be Catholic. Now, if you don't know where to start here, think about something like the creed. I'm Catholic because I believe in God. I believe God created the world. I believe Jesus is God in the flesh. I believe Jesus started the church. I believe that church is the Catholic church. But whatever you, you say, however you phrase it, get clear on why you're Catholic. It's crucial and it's step number two in this process. All right, step number three, plant the seeds. After you've been praying and fasting, once you're clear on why you're Catholic, you've started to prepare yourself, next you want to start to plant seeds of faith and trust in a young person's life. Even before you open up a conversation about God or the church or religion, you need to have a strong relationship with them. There needs to be a common bond of faith and trust. Now I know, I've talked to lots and lots of parents, they tell me, well, you don't understand, my relationship with my son or my daughter is just ruptured. It's in a really bad place. We can't even sit down and have a conversation. Fine, fine, start slowly. Make small acts of, of love that communicate that you're there for them no matter what they believe or no matter how they act. But start rebuilding that relationship because that bond is crucial to later conversations. Also here, when I say plant the seeds, I have in mind something of that what I, what I call seed gifts, seed gifts. Let me tell you what those are. Seed gifts are little CDs or books or DVDs that you plant in a young person's life that will get them thinking about religion again. Let me give you a real concrete example of how this plays out. A friend of mine named Josh was a typical Catholic kid. He went to Mass every Sunday, was raised in the church, he was involved in their parish, but then he went off to Texas A&M University and early on, within uh, one of the first few weeks, he got involved with an evangelical Bible study. They were extremely kind, they invited him to come out, he really liked these guys, and so he began getting deeper and deeper into this evangelical ministry. In fact, so much so that when he came home from his first semester at school, he not only told his parents that he's no longer Catholic, but he began trying to convince them that they should become evangelical because the Catholic Church is so wrong about everything. Needless to say, his mother was distraught. She thought, how could this happen so quickly? You know, we raised him in the church, we took him to Catholic school, and now he just left. But his mom didn't give up. She began praying for him. But in addition, she started planting seed gifts in, her, in his life. For her, these were little CDs from Lighthouse Catholic Ministries. Many of you probably know what I'm talking about here. At many of our parishes, we have a stand with different CDs of talks on Catholic topics. So she gathered a bunch of those and she would begin putting them in his life. She would slip one into his gym bag. She put one on his desk. Uh, Josh even remembers that uh, one of the CDs she put into the CD player in his truck so that when he turned on his truck, the CD would just start playing. Josh said, the first time she did that, I was so furious that I took the CD out of the player and I threw it out of the window of my truck. I thought, what is this woman doing? However, however, over time, one of these little seed gifts caught Josh's attention. 
It was a little booklet on the Eucharist, on the real presence of the Eucharist, which his mother had left on his desk without saying anything. Josh picked it up and began reading it, and he said, for the first time in my life, I learned that the Catholic Church believes that the Eucharist is really the body and blood of Jesus. He says, how I got through, you know, 12 years of Catholic school without ever encountering that or realizing that, I don't know. But that book was the first time I was exposed to that idea, and I was really intrigued. I thought, this is incredible. Either this is true, and the Catholic Church has Jesus, body and blood, or it's disastrously false, and I, that only reinforces why I am no longer Catholic. So he began reading. He began reading other books on the Eucharist. He started searching out blog posts and articles on the Eucharist, and eventually became convinced that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. That prompted a, a little bit of a longer search, but eventually Josh found his way all the way back to the Catholic Church. Josh was so then committed to his faith that he became a Catholic youth minister, and then after that he started a company called eCatholic, which is now the largest provider of Catholic websites in the world. He runs the parish websites for thousands of Catholic parishes. Now here's a guy who left the church, probably wasn't coming back, but because his mom prayed for him and left a small innocent booklet in his life where she knew he would find it, that he had a complete reversal of trajectory. So think about these little seed gifts and how you can plant them in a young person's life. If you want some good ideas of what sorts of seed gifts to use, I have a website here called returngameplan.com, returngameplan.com, and I have a list of what I consider to be the 12 best seed gifts to give to a young person who's left the church. So these are the 12 best CDs, books, and DVDs that have been proven to lead people back to the church. All right, so that's step number three, plant the seeds. Step number four is to start the conversation. Now here's where a lot of parents and grandparents start to get a little nervous. They say, okay, you know, praying, got it, check, I could do that. Preparing myself, planting seed gifts, wonderful, that's not too threatening. But starting a conversation, I don't know about that. You know, anytime I bring up religion or faith or God or church, my young person just tunes me out. They just shut off. They said, I, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to hear about it. So what do we do? How do we start a conversation? Well, there are a few simple tactics that I've learned over the years that have shown to work really well to get the conversation off the ground. That's your first goal. It's just to get it moving. The best approach is something that Greg Kokel, an evangelical apologist, calls friendly curiosity. When you open up a conversation with someone who's left the church, your goal is not to win them back to the church in that first conversation. Your goal is not to level a bunch of assertions about how wrong they are, wrong for believing what they do or acting how they do. Instead, you want to approach with a spirit of genuine curiosity. So you want to say something like, hey, can I just ask you a question? I just want to listen. You know, mom and dad, we, we raised you in the church. You went to mass with us every Sunday, but now you don't go. And so I'm just curious, you know, what changed? What changed? Why don't you want to go to mass anymore? I'm not trying to force you to go to mass today. I just want to know, you know, what changed? What are you thinking? Other good questions to ask are things like, what do you believe? Why do you believe it? What do you believe about God? What do you think of the Catholic church? You know, you describe yourself as spiritual but not religious. What do you mean by that? You know, how do you connect with God in your mind? Another good question to ask here, and I think it's my favorite one, is this. What's the biggest thing keeping you from returning to the church? What's the biggest thing keeping you from returning to the church? Lots and lots of people who have drifted away from the church have never considered this question. When you ask them, they'll say something like, well, I don't know. You know, I kind of just drifted away over time. There wasn't one thing that pushed or pulled me away. I don't know. There's not really anything holding me back from the church. And if that's the answer you get, that's a golden opportunity to say, well, why don't you come back? Why don't you come join me at Mass on Sunday? I'll, I'll pick you up. You come with me. However, if they do pinpoint a specific thing that's holding them back, now you have something to work with. Now you have something to go on. Maybe it's a bad experience they had. Maybe it's a particular doctrine or church teaching. Maybe they just feel like they're not getting anything out of mass or out of the church community. Whatever the case, if you can get them to answer this question, now you have direction to move in which to move the conversation. So that's your goal. Your goal at this stage is to just find out why did they leave. You're not trying to win them back. 
You're not trying to tell them why they're wrong. You're just trying to get an answer to this question. Why did they leave? Now, after you get that answer, then it's time to move on to step number five, which is to engage the issues, engage the issues. Now, the gap here between these last couple steps can be long. Sometimes it takes a while to build up a trust and a bond and to figure out what's really holding them back from coming to the church. So there could be a long period before you get to this step, but when you do, now you're in a more active approach. Now you're trying to help them overcome whatever obstacles or burdens are keeping them away. So for example, uh, for a lot of people, they struggle with the church's sexual moral teachings, things, on, things uh, regarding homosexuality, divorce, contraception, abortion. For many people, these would be the main stumbling blocks keeping them from the church. So if that's the case, if that's the answer they give, then you need to get up to speed on those issues. You need to, to realize good reasons why the church teaches what she does on these issues. Your goal in this step is to answer their objections. Answer their objections. Now, how do you do that? Well, thank goodness we live in an era where there are more Catholic resources than at any point in history. Thanks to the internet, you can find articles, blog posts, videos, uh, podcasts on any Catholic topic under the sun. However, let me recommend one go-to resource that I use almost every day. It's the website for Catholic Answers. It's an apologetics and evangelization apostolate. It's got the most difficult to remember website name of all, catholic.com, all right? So if you can't remember that, you're in a bad place, catholic.com. If you come up across an objection or an obstacle that you don't know how to answer, go to catholic.com, use their search box to search that topic, and you'll find simple, clear articles that explain why the church teaches what it does. Then you can either forward that article to the young person and say, hey, read this and tell me what you think. I'm curious to get your opinion on it. Or maybe you just imbibe those points yourself so that next time you have a conversation, you can begin explaining things yourself. But either way, you want to get up to speed on the objections that they put forth. All right, that's step number five, is to ex answer the objections. Step number six is to invite and connect. Now again, this step takes place after a long process, after you've been praying and fasting, preparing yourself, planting seeds, figuring out why they left the church and good reasons to help them return. That stuff can often take months to accomplish. But when the moment's right, when the young person is starting to at least be open to the church, maybe they're interested but not yet committed, that's when you should invite them to something involved with the church. You have many, many options here. For example, uh, many parishes have Bible studies or small groups that you might be able to plug a young person into. Almost every survey shows that the best way to ensure that somebody becomes a missionary disciple, that's the language that a lot of the bishops and the Holy Father are using, best way to ensure they become a missionary disciple is to connect them with other believers in a community. You know who does this really well? Our, our Mormon brothers and sisters. If you express any interest in Mormonism, you'll immediately be pulled into a small group community of other Mormons. Their goal is to latch you in quickly and hold you in tight. We don't do a good job at that, but we need to. As soon as a young person expresses openness to faith, we need to invite them into a group of other vibrant believers. In addition to Bible studies, there are several other events at your parish that might be a little less threatening. Think, for example, of big parish festivals. I know our parish has a big annual festival where we have rides and games and food booths and all that kind of stuff. That's a great place to invite someone who's been away for a long time because it gets them back onto the grounds of the parish and can stir up some nostalgic memories that they had when they were at the parish. It'll get the, the ball spinning once again in their mind. Whatever the case, though, you want to invite them and connect them. Invite them and connect them. Once you do that, though, once you sense that they've made a lot of progress, they've overcome their intellectual and emotional obstacles, they've connected with a the group, then you're ready for the final step, which is to close the loop. Close the loop. This step is crucial. I talk to a lot of parents who uh, have followed some of the ideas in my book, and they say, oh, I'm so excited. My son hasn't been to Mass in years. Now he's coming back to Mass. You have no idea how overjoyed I am to see him sitting next to me at Mass. 
Uh, but then when I follow up, like a, a couple months later, to say, hey, you know, how's he doing? How's, you know, is he still coming to Mass? And they say, well, you know, he's actually kind of, he started up going to Mass with us every week, and then it was like once a month, and now he's kind of drifted away again. The problem is that we make a lot of progress, we see a lot of momentum, and we feel so excited about it that we just kind of fizzle out at the end. What we need to do is to close the loop. Now, I'm using somewhat of a business term here. Think about if you have two businesses who are agreeing on a deal. Amazon, just yesterday they announced, uh, bought Whole Foods. Imagine if the CEO of Amazon and the CEO of Whole Foods discussed maybe getting together and starting a partnership and they shook hands and then they left. Nothing would happen. What they need is to sign a contract. They need to commit themselves to this deal for the long run, and that's what we need here. Now, you don't need to have a young person sign a contract, but what you need them to do is take a specific, tangible commitment to God and his church. Let me give you a, a few examples of what I mean by pursuing this commitment. First, connect them with a priest. If you can get a young person to commit to meeting with a priest, almost every in almost every case, the priest will be able to assess the situation and determine the appropriate next steps. So that's goal number one. Get them connected with a priest whenever they've traversed all these previous steps. You also might get them to commit to going to confession or to entering RCIA or joining some sort of small group. Whatever the case, you don't want them just to have warm, good feelings about the Catholic Church because those only last for a period of time and then they'll fade away. You want them to make a real, tangible commitment in their life to the church. Now again, I covered all seven of these steps in about 15, 20 minutes. These steps usually take months to go through, and they often come with setbacks. Sometimes you'll move forward, and then you move a little bit back. You'll have some good conversations and some bad ones. The key here is to persevere, to persevere. In fact, I like to remind parents and grandparents that your goal at every step along the way, with every prayer, with every conversation, your goal should just be to lead a young person one step closer to God. Just one. You don't have to get them from being far away from the church all the way back to the confessional in one day or in one conversation. Just help them take one step closer. Over time, those small steps will add up. And for the young people in each of our lives, they'll come closer and closer to the church and be able to realize all the graces that the church has waiting for them once they're there. Thank you.